In this course, we're going to be looking at the induction motor. Induction motors are the most common type of motor that you are likely to encounter. It's estimated that about half of all of the world's produced electricity is consumed by induction motors. Why is this? What makes them so popular? And why are they such an important part of our everyday life? Well, in this course, you're going to find out. We're going to have a look at some electrical motor theory. We'll look at the topics of voltage, current and resistance, magnets and magnetism, Faraday's law of magnetic induction, Lenz's law. We'll discuss topics like single phase and three phase electricity. And then we'll take a look at the main parts that make up an induction motor. These include the frame, end bells, stator, rotor, bearings, fan, terminal box, and even thermal protection. We'll cover some important topics as well that are just generally quite useful, such as how to read a nameplate, what torque is, motor speed, and slip. At the end of the course, we can look at maintenance tasks associated with induction motors and what you need to do to ensure your induction motor has a long and healthy working life. If you're interested in things like condition monitoring, or if you'd like to learn what that is, then we're going to cover that in this course as well. This course is an ideal refresher course for anyone who wants to learn about the most common type of electric motor out there, the induction motor. I guarantee you that irrespective of which engineering industry you're working in, you will encounter induction motors. Hope to see you on the course. Hi, and welcome to the course. My name's John Russell. I'm going to be your instructor for this course. It's a very interesting and exciting course about induction motors. Personally, I love the topic of electricity. I am actually a trained marine engineer, so I lean more towards steam and mechanical engineering than electrical engineering. But I have to say, I felt like I was reborn at the age of about 30 when I started to learn a bit more about electrical engineering. Now, I know this might seem quite late in life to have a second awakening. I always considered electrical engineering to be more like the dark side of the force, and I always used to stay more in the light. But as I learn more and more about electrical engineering, mostly electrical transformers originally, I became more and more fascinated with the principles and the theory that underline electrical engineering. It truly is a fascinating, wonderful topic, and it's quite a new industry if you look back at human civilization over the past 10,000 years. We're going to touch on that in the next lesson. I hope you enjoy the course as much as I've enjoyed creating it, and I hope you learn a lot from it. So let's get started now by taking a look at the history of electricity and how we came to depend so much upon it. Thousands of years ago in ancient Egypt, people noticed and recorded that if they touched certain kinds of fish, they would get a shock. At the time, they didn't know what this shock was. That was about 5,000 years ago. Later on, the Greeks and the Romans noticed that if they touched electric catfish or electric rays, they would also get a shock, but no one really understood why this should occur. About 600 before Christ, people started doing weird experiments. One example includes getting a piece of amber and rubbing it up against a cat's fur. Then they'd place the cat near some feathers and notice that the feathers would be attracted to the cat. But again, nobody understood why. About 2,000 years later, in the 1600s, William Gilbert conducted his own experiments in which he made a careful study of electricity and magnetism. Once again, he was busy with a piece of amber, and he came up with the word electricus, which is based on a new Latin word, meaning like amber or of amber, or electron, the Greek word for amber. Later on, the word electricus became the stem for the words electric and electricity. In America, 150 years later, Benjamin Franklin was messing around with electricity as well, and flying kites in a storm, which I recommend you don't do. In the year 1800, the Italian Alessandro Volta invented the voltaic pile, a basic battery. In 1820, André Marie Ampère noticed that electricity and magnetism were linked, and the field of electromagnetism was born. In 1821, Michael Faraday invented an electric motor. Six years later, George Ohm mathematically analysed an electric circuit. And about 30 years later, 
James Maxwell used mathematics to prove the link between electricity and magnetism. At this point in human history, the Industrial Revolution was well underway. We were using steam engines to cross oceans, to move hundreds of tons of goods along railways, to power factories, to dig up minerals out of the ground in mines, and for many other purposes. Whilst all this was occurring, the field of electrical engineering was making its own advances. People like Thomas Edison, Heinrich Hertz, Werner von Siemens and Nikola Tesla were breaking entirely new ground by inventing things that people thought were not even possible. As the progress of electrical engineering continued, the number of applications of electricity increased and electricity began to replace steam. At the same time, coal was being replaced by oil and gradually but surely, power stations began to emerge and people began to get electricity in their homes. A new era of human civilization had begun and electricity was at its core. For the remainder of this course, we're going to be learning about the amazing machine that consumes almost half of the world's electricity. Let's get started. So why do we even need electric motors in the first place? There are many different designs of electric motor. Some run on direct current, some run on alternating current, some are very large, some are very small. Small DC motors are used for things like small toys and hard drives in your computer. AC motors are used for heavier applications. In an industrial setting, we'll use them for things like centrifugal pumps, fans and compressors, to name but a few applications. If you take a look at the washing machine in your home, it most likely also uses an AC motor. Why do we need electric motors? This question might seem a little bit strange, but it's an important one. There are other options available to us if we want to make something rotate, and that is essentially all an electric motor is doing. There are exceptions to this. Sometimes we may wish to move something in a linear direction back and forth, but 99% of applications require rotary motion. Fans, compressors, pumps, even the wheels on electric cars must all rotate 360 degrees in order to operate correctly. Electric motors allow us to do this. They allow us to repeat a process over and over again, many times uninterrupted and reliably. We could do the same thing with a diesel engine. If we connect something to the shaft of a diesel engine, we'll also get the rotary motion, the rotary output from the engine that we require. So why not just do this? We could build smaller and larger engines, and over time they could replace electrical motors. We don't do this because an engine may require other things in order to operate. It may require, for example, a cooling water system, a fuel tank, maybe a hydraulic system, as well as things like air filters, lubrication oil filters, and fuel filters. All of these additional things require maintenance, and they have to be purchased, which makes them more expensive. With an electric motor, we don't have any of this. We require a cable, and if we connect that cable to the motor, an electrical current flows through the cable to the motor, then that is a way for us to get the power delivered to the motor in a clean, safe, and efficient manner. It's far more cost effective as well. So you can see that using the chemical energy in fuel, such as diesel fuel, to get the rotary output that we need to drive our pumps and compressors and fans etc is far less efficient than if we use an electric motor. They're cheaper, they're more reliable, they require less infrastructure, they're not noisy and they're very low maintenance. For all of these reasons we have electric motors but the core reason is that electric motors allow us to convert electrical power to mechanical power in a safe, reliable, cheap an efficient manner.